I don't want no oil. The spoil in my shoreline, I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things, a creeping and crawling, won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun. That black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. This is Joe DeMar, and you are lucky enough to have tuned into For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment, and we talk about them in the ways that they affect you, your family, your wealth, your health, your happiness, the happiness of your friends and your pets and everybody around you. And we try to do it with a little humor, and I think uh, we try to do it in a way that makes it interesting to everybody. And it really should be interesting because this is – ecology and the environment is the one issue that literally affects everybody. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. You know, It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you live on the earth. If you're a human being – the, the state of the planet's ecology and environment affects you directly. And it can affect you. People think about environmentalism and they think about the negative effects when we hurt the environment. But it's also very important to remember that positive effects when the environment is healthy, and we really like to focus on those. I, we're, you know, I had kind of a rough day yesterday. It was a really bit stressful Lots of things happened, and uh, so I was getting ready to do the show this morning, and I was still kind of on edge, still a little bit stressed out from yesterday. So I just went out into my backyard, and I was hoping to sort of get a calm sense of from being outside. And we have a, a nice neighborhood. There's lots of big trees around. So I went out there and just in my own backyard, and I could hear dozens of birds singing, and there was a rabbit over on the side yard eating some grass and and uh you know i saw the birds flying around eating the bugs i was looking at our garden which the garden's doing great this year i mean we have to water it because of the heat but we're, we're getting tons of zucchini and radishes out we're very happy with the garden and uh, there was even a family of uh, raccoons that walked down the alley as i was watching because i was out you know, I get up at 5.30 to do the show on Sunday, so I was out there in my backyard about 6 in the morning, a little bit before 6, and saw these raccoons. And, and it worked. That's that's the important thing to remember is that it did. It calmed me down. I felt better. You know, just a few minutes looking at trees and looking at critters and looking at and listening to nature, and I felt better. And it this, this could really really save your life sometimes i mean a healthy natural ecosystem getting out there into the trees and critters we had a, a kind of a big thing a few months back I, those of you might who listen to the show know that we lost our dog molly to cancer and so what my wife and i did was we after we had taken her to the vet for the last time we actually drove over to the uh, fort meg's and they've got a little parking lot there where you can just park and literally just sit and watch the Maumee River. 
And so we sat there for about an hour watching the Maumee River, watching the fish jump and, and catching the insects and things. And and then we actually got out and went for a little walk. There's some trails around the, the fort there. A lot of people don't know that, but there's trails along the river and along Fort Meigs. And uh, it helped. We felt better. And as I said, it's it's you can do this without medication and there's zero side effects. And it's just one of those great benefits of having a healthy, wealthy, wealthy ecosystem. So anyway, here I am doing the show as usual. I mean, normally we do the show from the station, which uh, is a great place, you know, and I like to go. And every now and then when I'm doing the show at the station, I'll swing by the, the science labs at the station and hang out there with the, the chief scientist, Dimitri, for a while. And uh, Dimitri, you know, it's, he feeds data to the newsroom, to the news center. And so I hang out with him and we'll look at uh, some of the experiments he's doing. I'll look at his acid rain charts and and the, he's got Geiger counters going. I'll look at his radiation emissions chart. We can, we can tell every couple of years when they refuel Davis Vesey because we can literally see the spike on, on the uh, radiation records. Anyway, you know, so normally we have those kinds of resources at our disposal, the, us broadcasters. But now, as usual, we're doing uh, going from our living rooms because of COVID. And it's hard to keep that, that sense that you're doing something great when you're just sitting in your living room. So I am dressed up. I have my suit on and my tie. And uh, last week I, I asked people to send me ties. And I, I have to confess, I wasn't able to get to the P.O. box this week. It's like, as you may have guessed, it's been kind of a crazy week. So uh, it's still open. I'm still, you know, if you want to send me a tie, as long as it's nothing obscene, I will wear it and I'll post it on the YouTube version of the show. And so you, you would just send a tie to Joe at P.O. Box 969, Bowling Green, Ohio, 43402. And uh, just thank you in advance. I'd be happy to happy to wear it. So, yeah, this this is a time when we really do need that that calming effect of of nature because so much is is going on. There's so many things happening. We've got a, a packed show for you today. Uh, our old friend Kevin Camps is going to be joining us at 8:15, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, liquid sodium reactors. The the Generation 4 reactors, and then I'll give you some news and information we could use. There's some really good news and, you know, some bad news. It's a, it's a really good mix of eco news this year. Of course, that's after we hear from our sponsors, our wonderful, wonderful sponsors. Uh, then uh, hopefully Rebecca Wood will be calling in, and we'll have a nice little chat with her. And then uh, our letter from the future and also, hopefully, sometime during this hour, we'll be hearing from you because this is a call-in show, and we'd love to hear your calls on any environmental topic, anything that might have caught your eye during the last week or any sort of questions you've always had about nature or ecology, and we will try to answer them. And if we can't answer them this week, don't worry. We, we will look up the information, and we will get, them, get that to you next week. So... Make use of this resource here at 866-240-1065. That's 866-240-1065 on any sort of environmental topic. So before we get to Kevin, we're hoping to hear from him at, at 8.15. I did want to just weigh in a little bit on this whole uh, the mask controversy. It's really gotten uh, out of hand because... The United States of America is literally falling behind the rest of the world because we have people that are telling you to ignore science, people that are telling you to, to disbelieve, They're throwing out all kinds of conspiracy theories and, and tying uh, mask wearing to political freedom versus political repression. And look, when you come... One of the reasons I love ecology and I love science is that at some point it literally transcends politics. You can't argue with carbon dioxide. Okay, the, the more carbon dioxide we put in the air, the hotter the planet's going to get, period. 
and it really doesn't matter what your political view is. Now, some people have made a career, a political career, out of denying science and denying reality and trying to convince people that they could do whatever they want. And it's very heartening to me that for the most part, they have failed to convince people. That's an important thing to remember during all this propaganda that's flying around in terms of masks and COVID and all these other issues. Most people understand. Most people understand that you've got to wear masks, that it you've got to stop the transmission of the disease. We have to protect each other by wearing by taking the proper precautions in terms of social distancing, etc. It's easy to forget that the majority of Americans, something like 70 to 80 percent, understand this and believe it. And because we only hear from the obnoxious minority, we only hear from the 20 percent that are posting incredible posts on all the social media just in terms of volume. A lot of that's automated, you know, a lot of a lot of those uh, memes that you see, a lot of those really irritating uh, anti-science things that you that you see are actually just uh, robots. That they're not even people behind them. Somebody pushes a button somewhere and it makes it look like Americans reject science when really the vast majority of us accept it. The problem is it's very hard if someone is telling you something you want to believe. It's very hard to, to disbelieve that if you know what I mean. What when uh, the governor opened Ohio too early, as most governors did, we wanted to believe that it was okay. It was a person in authority telling us, yes, you can go ahead and, and resume normal life. And, and three-quarters of the people at the time, when polled, thought that we were opening up too soon. And we were right. You know, We understood that we were opening up too soon. But when somebody in authority tells you something you want to believe, you know, yes, we knew it was bad for us. We knew it was too soon. But really, we wanted it to be true. And so it's hard, very hard to, to say to somebody like that, forget it. <laughs> You're leading us down the wrong path when we want that to be the right path. But sometimes you've got to look at the numbers. You've got to look at the truth. And you have to act on that, not on what you want to be the truth. I wish we didn't have to take radical steps to stop putting carbon in the air. I mean, it would be nice if we could just keep going the way we're going indefinitely. But I know that we can't. And most of us know it, too. Most, Like I say, the vast majority understand these things and accept them. And if we were really in a more democratic country, uh, like a lot of the European countries and, uh, you know, countries that have beaten COVID, like New Zealand, that completely have defeated COVID, no new cases, COVID-free. We could have been like that, but instead we, we ignored science, we ignored reality, and here we are. So what is happening now is that the numbers are going up, the, the graphs are going up just as we predicted they would, just as everybody kind of deep down knew they would if we opened up too early. And it's terrible. And, and this is one of the literally one of the only places in the world that's happening because all those other places understood the reality of this disease and t are taking the precautions to prevent it from spiraling out of control. And so this is just one example of what we need to do in terms of science. We need to accept science. We need to work it into our lives. We need to to actually act on what we know and what we believe. And that's why, you know, I've got a plug-in hybrid car. That's why we're putting solar panels on the house. That's why we're insulate the house and rewire it and, and you know, because not just because it's a good financial decision, uh, because it is a good financial decision. I mean, what we're doing what our, in our household is by generating our own power by, from the sun and getting our own heat, we're going to put in 
hopefully we're going to put in geothermal heating at some point. By getting our own power and our own heat and making our house n- n- carbon negative, that is we're going to put more energy into the grid than carbon we generate, we're going to save ourselves tons of money because think about it. You can either try to save up enough money to pay your electric bills and your heating bills indefinitely once you retire, or you can cut those bills down. You can supply your own energy. And the the reason it's better to do the second than the first is you have no idea in the future what's going to happen to those electricity and those heating prices. The gas is low right now, but it could spike out of control in a few years. And electricity has been going up steadily, and it's going to continue to go up steadily as as utilities like Energy Harbor continue to push for the expensive energy sources like nuclear and coal and ignore wind and solar. So it doesn't doesn't just make good economic sense, though. It makes good sense for the world, for the environment, for ecology. Based on an ecological environmental standpoint, this is the right decision. That's uh, just something I wanted to talk about today. Oh, yeah, the solar system work is progressing, although we've run into a little snag. The the fancy inverter we want that will also charge the, the our electric car, apparently the dealer didn't actually have them, even though they said they did. So now my uh, fellow's my the fellow's installing my system is searching around the country to see if anybody else has one. So a little bit of a hiccup, but uh, like I say, my wife and I have been hoping to put solar panels up for 40 years, ever since we first got married and started our, our relationship. And so we can wait another week or two. We could be patient about this. But uh, the racks went up for the ground-based solar panels, so that's nice. They're They're in place. And I'll show you pictures on the YouTube version. All right. Well, we are uh, expecting Kevin Camps' call and or wondering, is Kevin on the line, Russell? Did Kevin call in yet? Okay. All right. Well, we will attempt to send Kevin some uh, reminders here that, that that we're looking forward to talking with him. And the subject we're going to be talking about is Something that, uh, you know, I, full disclosure, once again, I'm, I'm the political director of the Ohio Green Party, but on this show I normally don't speak for the Green Party. I speak only for myself, as do all my guests, as do you, if you call in at 866-240-1065. But uh, I can say this time, officially, that the Ohio Green Party came out against HB 104. That's the House bill we've we've reported on before that would put into place a, uh, a cadre of nine nuclear power people from the nuclear power industry who would be empowered to bring nuclear wastes into the state of Ohio and to try to fiddle around with designs for new reactors and, and uh, you know, basically just turn Ohio into a radioactive waste dump. Well, this law, HB 104, proposed law, uh, the Ohio Green Party came out against it, and as soon as we did, as soon as we made that announcement on social media and so forth, the pro-nuclear trolls jumped on us, and they started talking about uh, fourth-gen molten sodium reactors, and they said, we've got to build these because these are the, the answer to all our problems, you know, that, that uh, <laughs> this will solve all our energy needs, and they, they say it will eliminate nuclear waste, which is, uh, you know, crazy, which is completely inaccurate. So that's why I, I invited Kevin on to talk this week, because um, this fairy story that, that molten sodium reactors are going to eliminate the nuclear waste problem is being used to push HB 104, and so we have to get once again, we have to get the correct information out there. We have to get the facts out there. Hopefully, Kevin will be calling in shortly, and uh, I'm I'm going to try to to get some messages in here to uh, make that happen. And in the meantime, I can talk a little bit about our sponsors. I'm going to go a little early on the sponsors this week. 
For a Green Future is brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, they provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. The Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every single day of the year. And there's several ways to get a hold of the Wood County Park District. One is to call them, and their number is uh, 419-353-1897. That's 419-353-1897. The other, the other way is to send them an email at wcparks.org. You can go on there, and uh, they have ways to contact them. And, of course, you can also look for their app. And you go to the App Store and just search for WC Parks. And this is, like I say, in this, these times of stress, the, the parks have become literally a lifeline for so many people that we that we're very grateful that they're that they're there. We're also grateful for our patrons. Yay! Our patrons are people who've gone to Patreon.com. That's uh, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And they just searched for For a Green Future. And there they found a um, very nice page that has different levels of membership. And what you can do is just sign up for a small monthly donation at whatever level you're able to afford. And it will just come painlessly out of your checkbook. You don't even know have to know that it's coming out. And, you know, that little bit of money makes a big difference here on For a Green Future because uh, our patrons are really uh, kind of a lifeline for us. They've, they've kept us going uh, for all this time. This is episode 79. We're, we're already 79 episodes into uh, For a Green Future. And thank you very much for our patrons to have to help keep us going. Okay, well, I'm, we're still not hearing from Kevin. And uh, so I guess we will just carry on here and uh, go right to our eco news and views there's some really good uh, news right now i want to start with that but kevin will be joining us as you just heard momentarily so uh, uh, russell just let me know when he's on the air i think what we'll do we have time to talk about one of our eco news events eco news happenings uh, we got unfortunately this is a little bit of bad news, and that is that a few months back we had on our show the guest, uh, Jesse Deer in the Water, and he was with Kraft. So Jesse Deer in the Water was talking about uh, an appeal that they had before the Atomic Safety Licensing Board, uh, basically the spent fuel pools around the Fermi, nu- Fermi 2 nuclear power plant in Michigan are the corroding. There's something called Boraflex that surrounds the spent fuel pool and it, it absorbs neutrons because those spent fuel rods are shooting off neutrons at incredible rates. They're intensely radioactive and that stuff is degrading. It's starting to crumble after years of being bombarded with radiation. And when they got their uh, undeserved license extension to keep the plant going, they promised they would replace this Boraflex stuff. And in, now they're, they're saying, oh, they want to use a, a cheaper, faster material and so the the people of good people at craft appealed before the atomic safety licensing board saying look that's not the deal they said they were going to use this good stuff that they promised to use and now they're trying to do some chintzy cheap stuff and the atomic safety licensing board has uh, denied their motion they have lost in front of that board which is not too surprising because it instead of the atomic safety safety licensing board it should actually be called the uh, Atomic Cheerleading Board because they pretty much always side with the, the nuclear power industry. I don't know of any cases where they've actually ruled against them. Maybe Kevin will. but uh, So just that little bit of update. Sorry about that to have to report that. But I'm not sorry to have on our line, finally, our guest, Kevin Camps. Kevin, hey, are you there? Hello, I'm here. 
So let's just start off with reminding the people uh, who you are and who you're with. Sure. I serve at Beyond Nuclear. My title is Radioactive Waste Specialist, and I'm also on the board of directors of Don't Waste Michigan. I'm on um, the Kalamazoo Chapter's uh, board of directors. All right. Great. Well, we're very happy to have you on the show and, you know, returning guest, happy to have you back on the show. Specifically, I wanted to talk today a little bit about these uh, quote-unquote fourth-generation liquid sodium reactors. The the pro-nuclear people are touting these as the solution to nuclear waste, and that sounded like a lot of malarkey to me. Could you could you uh, tell us a little bit what a fourth-gen nuclear reactor is supposed liquid sodium reactor is supposed to be and uh, what it's supposed to do and then what it actually does. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it gets confusing because they make these claims every generation or so, so I guess they've lied about it four generations in a row. Some of these designs are, are that old. They go back to the 1950s, if not the 1940s. So every once in a while, they'll dust off these plans and try to get lots of money out of the U.S. taxpayer because that's who's going to pay for it through Department of Energy Research Grant. Let me jump in there, and I, I think that's a very important point, Kevin, to, to drive home yet again, is that these promises they're making for the fourth-gen sodium reactors are literally the same promises they've made for every reactor. I mean, we were initially promised nuclear power that was too cheap to meter and so safe that you could have a nuclear power plant right next to your house, and, and it there would be no problem. And for for 60 years, literally the same people, these atomic power insiders, have been making the same promises. And so that's important to keep in mind when we say, okay, here we go again. All right, so here we go again. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, they used to call them breeder reactors. So like Fermi Unit 1 was a liquid um, sodium-cooled breeder reactor. They were breeding plutonium. So they were supposedly making plutonium to be used and other reactors these days when you mentioned the you know reactor design that will eat radioactive waste or whatever they say that they call a burner reactor they're going to burn radioactive waste in these reactors so they just kind of uh change their spin to try to sell it the liquid sodium part's very uh concerning that's sort of what went wrong at at fermi unit one so sodium is flammable and explosive on contact with air or water so if anything goes wrong, you could have an explosion, you could have a fire. Uh, what happened at Fermi Unit 1 just south of Detroit, just north of Toledo, was blockage of the liquid sodium coolant flow, and two irradiated nuclear fuel assemblies melted down. It was October 5th of 1966. So the famous book is called We Almost Lost Detroit by John Fuller. That's the kind of thing to look forward to. They have problems when they're brand new, they have problems when they're old, and those problems can be very large scale. Now, they say that that these things burn nuclear uh, waste, but as I understand it, okay, nuclear power plants produce over 200 radioactive isotopes. These these sodium reactors aren't going to magically (laughs) unradioactive, you know, unradioactivize these isotopes, right? I mean, you... If you have radioactive iodine and you put it somehow injected into this liquid sodium that's swirling around in a liquid sodium reactant reactor, it doesn't neutralize it. I mean, it, it doesn't make it not radio radioactive iodine, right? No, not at all. In, in fact, uh, Fermi Unit One's high-level radioactive waste, even though it only operated for a few years there, incredibly enough, uh, the sodium bonded stuff, as they call it, this is the meltdown material. It supposedly needs its own repository, and the reason for that is it is bonded with sodium, which is so highly chemically reactive. So incredibly enough, they have decided that they can't bury it with the rest of the industry's high-level radioactive waste, and it's incredible that they say that because repositories you know, start at billions of dollars, if not $100 billion each. So that this stuff needs its own repository is a pretty incredible admission. Really, they mean they're going to have to sit on it forever because they don't know what to do with it. The breeder reactor design, the idea that you're going to make more plutonium, um, we already have too much plutonium. Isn't that true? I mean, there's plutonium 
sitting in huge piles in places like England that um, we don't need another ounce of plutonium, as, but instead, but these breeder reactors generate it by the ton. Yeah, I mean, the mixed oxide fuel fabrication facility, which was a $8 billion waste of money, the whole idea was to try to deal with tens of tons of military plutonium that is excess to the Pentagon's needs. So you're right. We are awash in plutonium, uh, not just in the U.S. and the U.K., but Russia, too, and other countries. So it's another one of these uh, pie in the sky, let us make more plutonium, we'll turn it into reactor fuel kind of dreams that is really a nightmare. I mean, there were warnings back in the 1970s that if you're making plutonium and separating it for commercial nuclear power industry purposes, you're talking police state because... Any amount of plutonium that goes missing uh, could be made into weaponry. It only takes a few pounds, if you know what you're doing, to make an atomic bomb out of plutonium. Mm-hmm. And the the unique thing about plutonium, of course, is that you you don't even have to get the atomic bomb part right in order to uh, have a, bo- a dirty bomb that would make an area uninhabitable pretty much forever. Yeah, plutonium is ultra-hazardous. Just a speck in the human lung can initiate lung cancer. There may be years or even decades of latency before the fatal cancer shows up, but it's almost guaranteed lung cancer from a molecule of plutonium in your lung. So if you disperse that through a radiological dispersal device, I mean, chances are you just write off that neck of the woods forever as um, too contaminated to live in. And if you were to undertake a cleanup, it would cost um, unimaginable amounts of money. And just to get really technical, so that's because plutonium is what they call an alpha emitter, right, which is a a form of uh, radioactivity that's extremely high energy. And uh, as I understand it, in fact, the, the charged particles that come off of plutonium are so energetic that um, if that they don't make it all the way through your skin because the, the pluto they will react it'll smash into something in in your in the dead layers of your epidermis before it gets into your body but if it gets inside your body and it can hit living cells uh as you say it's it's like guaranteed cancer it, it's it's uh, incredibly dangerous is, is that correct yeah and very long lasting mhm yep very long lasting too the half life of plutonium 239 is 24,000 years, so you have to multiply by 10, that's 240,000 years. That's how long the hazard persists. So, yeah, quarter of a million years. And we've already made tons and tons of this stuff, and uh, we do not need any more. So, yeah, but this is part of what's being used to push uh, House Bill 104 here in Ohio. But are, are you you're familiar with House Bill 104? Yeah, yep, I've been trying to follow it. Yeah, what what do you think of it? Oh, it's incredible. It really sticks out like a sore thumb as the nuclear power industry having its way with a state legislature, um, not in a good way. So incredibly, uh, you know, the thorium proponents, as you mentioned, the fourth generation reactor um, snake oil salesmen have set up shop in Ohio, uh, this uh, think tank out of Cleveland, and they're trying to get not only um, the state government to fund their misadventures, but, you know, there's Department of Energy money that they would probably be applying for at some point as well. So that would be state taxpayer money and uh, federal taxpayer money. Just going straight into this uh, authority, quote-unquote, which could actually negotiate with the federal government directly to bring nuclear wastes into Ohio, no matter what the people of Ohio want. There's no point of input for the public in any of the, the processes described in this this House Bill 104. And uh, yeah, the problem is when the nuclear industry has its way with the Ohio State Legislature, we're the ones that get screwed <laughs> because we, we're mm-hmm. the ones that has to have to actually pay for all this crap. And I just want to, I'm going to be we're talking more about this next week because I'm hopefully going to have a guest on who uh, lives near a, a radioactive waste dump in St. Louis, which is uh, being threatened right now by a by an underground fire. Um, and I just want to stress to the listeners here that the long-term burden of trying to deal with 
these nuclear wastes um, over and over and over again. Communities will bring them in thinking it's jobs, thinking it's, you know, something for the future. But instead, what they get is decades of uh, decades of pollution, decades of, of radiation exposure. I mean, uh, is that your experience? Could you? Yeah, is that what you see since you're the, as a radioactive waste specialist at Beyond Nuclear? Yeah, it's uh, deadly forever. It's a curse on all future generations. I mean, you mentioned St. Louis. That is some of the oldest atomic waste of the nuclear age. So our board president, Kay Dry, who's based in St. Louis, has been watchdogging those very wastes uh, her entire anti-nuclear career, which began in the early 1970s, so pretty much a half century now. It was Manhattan Project Waste that was made in downtown St. Louis at Mallinckrodt Chemical and over the decades was secretly dumped illegally on the outskirts of St. Louis at the time. But since then, the uh, urban area has overtaken those dump sites. They're now residential neighborhoods built on top of where the waste was dumped. So unfortunately, um, a lot of families have paid a very high price for being exposed uh, to those wastes. And uh, every time you make radioactive waste, that kind of curse will extend forward into the future uh, forever. So, you know, with E-Generation out of Cleveland trying to make a buck on the Ohio state taxpayer in House Bill, I forget the number right now, they, yeah, House 104. Bill 104, they're creating a curse on all future generations. They've even explicitly mentioned uh, Perry's nuclear waste and Davis Bessie's nuclear waste which is already a curse on the residents of Ohio. That's what they want to play around with, with their reprocessing, which is a, a nuclear weapons proliferation risk, not to mention uh, a very significant uh, radioactive pollution risk for the air, the water. That's a question to ask about where reprocessing would take place in Ohio. Are they going to do it into the Great Lakes watershed, or are they going to do it into the Ohio River watershed? Because they're going to have large surface water runoff and uh, poison people downstream. So those are the kinds of things to worry about with these proposals. As I say, everywhere I know of that this has been tried, like West Valley, New York, for example, they tried nuclear fuel reprocessing, and they have ended up with a, a terrible nuclear waste dump that with plutonium contamination and and an eroding, they, a bunch of nuclear waste buried in trenches, which are eroding and heading right you know if this creek that runs through the property erodes even more then it will just carry a bunch of plutonium and other nuclear wastes right into lake erie and so yeah and that was again back in the like i, I believe that was active back in the 80s and but here we are 30 40 years later and the, the wastes you know the radioactivity doesn't go away just because the company goes bankrupt or because a you know bunch of Yahoo's with bachelor's degrees <laughs> make really bad decisions. They they can this as I understand it this this legislation would allow them to do eminent domain and put these wastes literally anywhere. And since they're based in Cleveland, they may actually just put it in the middle of Cleveland. I don't know, or they might put it in Toledo. It, it's it's uh, it's pretty insane. So I'm glad Beyond Nuclear's uh, looking at this. No, you're not exaggerating about putting it in an urban area. I mean, it's a different um, process. It's uh, actually fracking wastewater treatment and processing that has set up shop right on the edge of downtown Detroit in Hamtramck. And incredibly, it's in a residential neighborhood. And the people who live there are mostly low-income people of color. Certainly, there are African Americans there. But there are even immigrants from places like Bangladesh who live in this neighborhood. And this company called U.S. Ecology has set up a toxic radioactive wastewater treatment facility in their neighborhood. And U.S. Ecology is very infamous in the nuclear industry because they are a radioactive waste uh, disposal company as well. So just one example in uh, Barnwell, South Carolina, which is James Brown's hometown. That's what they're famous for. But what they're infamous for is they have a U.S. Ecology radioactive waste dump that has been leaking for decades. It was national uh, 39 states uh, dumped radioactive waste there, including Michigan and Ohio, and it's leaking into the surrounding area. So uh, churches have had to have their front yards dug up down to a deep depth. Uh, residents have had to have that same thing happen. 
because the radioactivity is moving out. So wherever these folks set up shop, they pretty much uh, ruin the neighborhood radioactively. If House Bill 104 passes, they're they're poised to to ruin Ohio. Um, so yeah, we're we're following it. It's been assigned a committee, but I, I don't think there's any hearing dates set yet. But uh, yeah, like I said, I'm glad we're I'm glad Beyond Nuclear is uh, aware of this. Could you just uh, let our people know if they want to get more information about Beyond Nuclear? How how would they do that? Yeah, our website is just www.beyondnuclear.org. And we've got a lot of subject matter areas on the left-hand side menu. So if you're looking at radioactive waste or reactors or whatever issue, that's where you'd find it. Thanks so much for being on, Kevin. I'm, I'm sorry there was a little bit of confusion about uh, <laughs> how we were going to do it, but I'm, I'm glad we did it. All right, Joe. Thanks for having me. Sure. Okay, that was Kevin Camps. So now uh, back to environmental news and views. I told you we had a little bit of a loss there with the the Fermi Atomic Safety Licensing Board uh, decision, but uh, we do. there was a huge environmental win this past week. In fact, it was so huge, you may have actually heard about it on the mainstream media. The Dakota Access Pipeline has been ordered shut down by a federal district court judge. Uh, his name, he's the district court judge for Washington, D.C. His name is uh, Bosberg, and on July 7th, he ordered the Dakota Access Pipeline shut down because it violated NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, set way back in 1970. This is a, a great win, and it's something that the, the Native American tribes in the area and all kinds of environmental groups have been fighting f- for years. The DAPL, the Dakota Access Pipeline, is the pipeline that uh, had the big uh, water is life encampment uh, that went on for some months uh, back back a few years ago, and uh, I was there too, and uh, actually got arrested protesting this pipeline, but they've been fighting it in court the whole time, even though they went ahead and built it and have been running it, and finally the federal judge said, yeah, the, the people that own that have violated NEPA, they, they violated the law when they rammed this thing through without sufficient environmental review. And several things have happened since then to prove that judge right and to prove that the NEPA review was insufficient. They've had several spills on that pipeline, at least three. And a neighboring pipeline, uh, back just this past November, the Keystone pipeline, leaked about a half a million gallons of, of oil. And this is a pipeline right nearby. So this Judge has actually ordered that the pipeline be shut down and drained. And so he ordered that on July 7th, and he gave him 30 days to do it. Now, it is a, a great victory, and it is wonderful. Unfortunately, that's the district court, and what usually happens is now now it goes to the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals is much more uh, conservative, and the Federal Court of Appeals will likely reverse that just because, you know, they they like pipelines. <laughs> the, the higher you get up in the, the federal court system, the more conservative the appointees have been for the past, uh, oh, past 12 years or so, and so they are more likely to allow pollution and more likely to allow the destruction of the environment, but the basic thing about uh, DAPL, about the Dakota Access Pipeline, is that it's the wrong infrastructure. We should not be building new carbon-based infrastructure. We have to stop, and that means we have to stop. It means no DAPL. It means stop building these pipelines. And speaking of the wrong kind of infrastructure, an update on the OSU gas project. We had Last week, we had a record number of guests on talking about this plan at Ohio State University to put a, a natural gas plant in there. And that, that is that they have set a hearing for July 14th. That's this uh, this coming week. This is a, a, a hearing to see whether or not they can go forward. The Sierra Club is uh, appealing in this hearing. They're one of the, the, the people in there. But the, the problem with, with this is that it's a, a hearing in front of 
the siting board, the Ohio uh, Power Siting Board. And the Ohio Power Siting Board has a history of being incredibly biased against wind, against solar, and incredibly biased in favor of nuclear and in favor of coal and in favor of natural gas. They've had some amazing decisions in, over the past year. Uh, things like uh, they voted to allow a wind farm uh, that was going to be put on in Lake Erie, but they also said it had to be turned off most of the time. And <laughs> so the, the, the people who are building the wind farm are, are like, what? <laughs> you gave us permission to build something that we can't run? And uh, they also, American Electric Power had also put into the siting board for a huge solar farm and it went through all the processes and it took years and all the environmental statements and then at the very last minute literally that the meeting that was there and they were expect the siting board was expected to approve it the chair of the siting board said uh you know what i think there's some endangered species living nearby that thing so we're going to disallow it <laughs> and so you know don't hope for much on the, the 14th. The, the, most likely they will go ahead and, and approve this. And that's DeWine, his, his appointees. He appointed natural gas and fossil fuel industry people to the siting board. So this is not a surprise, uh, but we do still need to keep watching it and uh, keep on top of it. But we will finally do that. Uh, finish off with another win. This is the last of the eco news. And that win is uh, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline has been uh, abandoned. That There was a huge pipeline all along the Atlantic and it was a proposed first in 2014 and people have been fighting it ever since. It would have it would have wrecked the Appalachian Trail. It would have gone through all kinds of wildlife refuges and, and national parks and not to mention farmland and people's homes and and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and last month the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the pipeline. Not a surprise. But uh, what has happened is that the companies that were pushing the pipeline, Dominion and Duke Energy, have given up. <laughs> They've said, you know what, this is just too much hassle. And part of the reason they're willing to give up on things like this is that now natural gas is more expensive than wind or solar. So they were spending millions upon millions of dollars fighting these legal battles in order to put a, a more expensive energy source in that would cost them more to maintain and make them less profit. And somewhere, somehow, at some board of directors at Dominion and Duke, somebody said, wait a minute, <laughs> what are we doing? If we win this battle, we've committed ourselves to an expensive form of energy that takes tons of, of people to maintain and tons of effort to keep going and we have to keep buying gas at who knows what price let's just put up windmills and solar panels and so kudos to them for making that decision uh supreme court yeah you know you just made the usual decision but uh that is a big win for all of us for the environment that they have stepped back from that all right and speaking of big wins uh we have a big win. We have Rebecca on the line. Rebecca, hi. How you doing? I'm oh, doing not bad. How are you? Are you I'm there? Sorry, my sister. My sister. Hello. <laughs> Rebecca <laughs> Wood. My, I think you might have yeah. your phone muted or something. But uh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm not imagining things. And, you know, Russell's not uh, not teasing me there. So Rebecca, whenever you manage to get you know, actually on the line, yeah, just, Rebecca, whatever you manage to get back on, just, just jump right in, because, uh, you know, I could, I could use your, your insights here. So, uh, but in the meantime, we'll carry on with the show, is now it's time for our letter from the future. Okay, as you know, every week, my great-great-granddaughter, who's living in the year 2300, Maria I., uh, sends me a nice letter. There's a flash of photons next to my bed, and, and there it is, the letter from the future. Here's, here's this week's letter. Dear GGG, taking this walk was definitely the right decision. I'm now regularly walking more than five miles a day. I was sore and tired the first few days, 
but now I'm feeling more and more energetic, and I have to stop myself from overdoing it. It was just last week that I remember being able to pass a bench along the trail without having to stop and rest for the first time. Now I can hike for more than an hour without resting. It's getting warmer as I head south, but it's still nowhere near as hot as it was in your time. Besides, the canopy of branches that meet over the trail helps keep me cool. Forests actually absorb heat, and we have a lot more forest cover than you did in 2020. Michael is doing well. He's not only able to walk around his hospital room, he started talking again. I talk with him every day, almost constantly, as I hike along the trail, sending him holographic pictures of the landscape. I'm missing him more and more every day, and I'm thinking that once I finish this walk, I'll be ready to head back to Zapoliani. <coughs> Love you, GGG. Marie I. Okay, there's our nice letter for Marie. And here's our nice call for Rebecca. Rebecca, are you finally there? Hello. Am I? How are you? Good, how are so, you? I am well. <laughs> Well, my, uh, got, yeah, my 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 coworker is behaving obnoxiously again. Oh, uh, your your coworker with the tail. Yeah, that one. And go yeah. see mommy. Oh. Go see mommy. Go tell your mommy she wants you, dog. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> I think we got to settle for a minute. <laughs> All right. Well, glad to have you on the line, Rebecca. How are you doing? Not too bad. It, uh, it's it's nice. It's a little cooler this weekend. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was out there at about six o'clock. I was telling the people, and uh, it was really beautiful out there, temperature wise. So, how yeah. much of the show have you been able to to follow? Uh, a couple seconds of you talking about COVID, and most of the interview, and a lot of stuff since the interview. Ah. Okay. So, so what did you think? What do you think of this? Uh, what Kevin had to say about these uh, fourth gen sodium reactors. Oh golly, it sounds appalling, but you know, there's almost no good news about nuclear reactors is there. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> yeah, the, the only two that are under construction down there in, in Vogtel, uh are, are again, you know, they pushed the, the completion deadline back again. They're billions and billions <laughs> As Carl Sagan used to say, billions and billions of dollars <laughs> over budget, and years and years behind schedule, and, and uh, hopefully they'll never complete them. Though that's that's the thing. <laughs> when I when That'd I say a nuclear power plant, yeah, it's behind schedule. I would like them to be behind schedule to infinity, <laughs> so that they never permanently behind schedule. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's all just more and more, uh, hey, we had a really bad idea. Give us money with these people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, How come they, uh, that works for them? You, I, could, I, could, I could come up with bad ideas and demand money for it. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's the angle you should be taking, Rebecca, is just get a couple legislators in your pocket. They're not that expensive. I mean, that's, okay. that's the, the amazing thing is that these people... You know, for just a few Jump. thousands of dollars, these people are Go willing to sell Volko, out done, the entire state one, forever. Consecutive wins. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, the, you the, those it's judges. kind of amazing that the, if you look at the numbers that the donations made to these uh, to these corrupt legislatures, they're not that big. You know, I, you always think, you know, oh, they they're getting money. They must be getting hundreds or billions, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And no, it's just a few thousand. So. Yeah, so if you That's could sad, they need some kind of friends. a they need a they need a corrupt legislators union. I feel sorry for them now. <laughs> right, yeah, they're just not organized there, yeah. No. So, I understand you had a, a kind of a run in with climate change the other day. You were you were trying to bring all you were trying to do is bring supper home and and what what happened? Oh my God! Yeah, I, I we decided we had an extra ten bucks, and I forgot to bring take something out for dinner. So I was gonna walk to rallies, which is about oh, I'm gonna say forty minute round trip plus the time at rallies. So yeah, I got there. I ordered. Uh, 
I walked for about, oh, five minutes. It started to rain. I was like, oh, okay, it's raining, you know. Uh, and then it, about five minutes later, it started to flat out monsoon. It was crazy. It, it was, it was, for a couple minutes, it was raining so hard, I literally could not see my hand in front of my face. It was that bad. And guess what? Those little rally plus, those little uh, paper rally bags don't hold up very well under <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. one of them pretty much dissolved immediately. Unfortunately, it was the one with the fries in it. So I, I picked most of it up, and I was like clutching the entire squashy ball to my chest, trying to get dinner home, which I eventually did. But I left a puddle in the elevator, and they had to change and dry off before I was allowed to sit on the couch. Yeah. Well, and, unfortunately, <laughs> the climate change is predicting more. Uh, Dinner dissolving rainstorms like that in the future. No! So how will reason, our but... fries ever be safe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. When they start, when they come to take your fries away, you know, then it gets serious. All right, yeah, Monica, well, it's gotten real now. Time. We are. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks all to everyone for listening. This is Joe Damar and Rebecca Wood. And we are signing off. For kids with leukemia, nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that new